by global CL4. Here I will start the call with the update of the quarter, followed by Arun, who will give the financial update, which will then be followed by the Q&A session. As usual, I would like to remind you that everything that is said on this call that reflects any outlook for the future or which may, can be considered as a forward-looking statement must be viewed in conjunction with the risk and uncertainties that we face. These risks and uncertainties are included but not limited to what we mentioned on, in the prospectus, filed with SEBI, and subsequent annual reports that you can find on our website. Having said that, I would like to hand over the call to Hiral. Hiral, over to you. Thanks, Damani, and uh, good day, good evening to everybody. Um, thanks for joining the call, and hope everybody is staying uh, safe and uh, all your families are keeping safe. My name is Hiral Chindrana. I'm the global CEO. I uh, would like to focus on four things uh, in my uh, discussion, and we'll hand it over to Arun uh, to provide more details on the financial performance as well. Uh, the first topic is uh, giving you a few highlights on uh, key metrics. The second is around the business updates and outlook uh, around people and talent. And uh, I'd like to end with strategic vision and our progress uh, on that as we get ready for uh, another fiscal year. Coming to the financial highlights, uh, you would have seen the results and some of the key metrics, but I want to highlight uh, two or three things very quickly. And Arun will cover it in a lot more detail, but the revenue performance uh, year on year was 24.6%. Um, we had uh, a quarter and quarter growth, which was uh, slightly lower, but um, the nine months put together for uh, this fiscal year compared to the last nine months from the last fiscal year, our year on year growth was almost uh, greater than 29%. Our order book performance was the highlight of the quarter. We actually um, had tremendous deal momentum. We had alluded to this in the last call in October as well where I had uh, given indication of some large deals as well as uh, mid-sized deals that we've been working on. And uh, that is reflected in the 12-month uh, order backlog as well as in the order book performance, which again is greater than 34% uh, year on year. A uh, lot more uh, deals on the pipeline. We continue to see good uh, traction, and I'll uh, cover that in a bit uh, in the business commentary. Operating EBITDA, we've been able to maintain in spite of, um, you know, talent costs and uh, uh, various other investments, um, you know, 21.1%, and and we have, uh, you know, communicated that in the past as well in terms of our rigor of uh, managing the, the business. Um, but uh, again, I don't recover more details on each of those metrics. What I do want to highlight in the, uh, uh, as part of the performance, is uh, this is one of our quarters uh, that we've had. One of the areas that we did focus on significantly was uh, recruiting and then, of course, retention. And uh, we'll cover that in the people and the talent part, but uh, our engine is now firing uh, to cater to the demand that we're seeing in the market. And um, we will uh, continue to focus on recruiting and retention uh, being the key priority for uh, the coming quarters. The other element which is, is part of our results as well is our uh, ability to now engage with larger clients and Fortune 1000 customers. I had mentioned this in the past call as well, but uh, we've added uh, even in Q3 seven new Fortune 1000 clients, uh, which uh, is reflected in our uh, results, as well as a uh, lot more discussions in the pipeline. So we're feeling a lot more confident of uh, large customers engaging us in strategic discussions around their digital and cloud journey and uh, our ability to um, not just interact in strategic conversations but close larger deals with them as well. That's a summary of the highlights on the, the financial metrics and uh, let me go on to the business commentary and give you a flavor of uh, specific areas that we are focused on. In October, when we had spoken, there were three or four things uh, we had communicated. One is around the deals and the large um, deals that were there in the pipeline. The second was around our co-sell strategy, combining the power of Oracle Cloud and our digital services to create more integrated deals. Number three was uh, obviously uh, our focus on strategic bets, which included uh, data automation and uh, focus on healthcare and life sciences. So in that context, let me start with UK. And, um, you know, we are very excited about the, the largest deal that Mastic has closed in the history of our 
um, uh, you know, being and and you know, this has been communicated um, in the public forums. I had alluded again to it in our October call, but we could not declare it officially. Uh, we have now um, officially communicated that uh, it is a greater than sixty million dollar deal over four years, and uh, more importantly, it's a very strategic uh, impact to the uh, UK's public infrastructure and health. Uh, you know, healthcare IT at the national level. When uh, patients um, go through different implants and medical devices, um, there's always uh, reactions and uh, after effects. And our solution that we are designing, developing, and operating for NHS is actually going to create a, a data intelligence uh, infrastructure to manage that and provide real time information so that those after effects can be managed. And NHS um, is very excited about this, uh, so is the entire UK government. Uh, as well as we have seen much more uptick in NHS itself uh, on a few other areas, which we will announce in the next quarter, but there are deals that we have won in January as well. I mentioned NHS specifically because we had, again, very transparently communicated that we had seen a dip in uh, the NHS uh, revenue in Q2, uh, and that had effects in Q3 as well. Uh, but now we feel confident with the order book and the momentum that we should be able to get that back on an uptick uh, starting this quarter, which is in Q4. Moving on to uh, our business in the Oracle Cloud space. As you know, this has been uh, one of uh, the areas we've continued to grow, um, actually across all geographies. Uh, however, I'm very proud to uh, say that our North America, U.S. business, when it comes to Oracle Cloud, uh, had a really solid order booking quarter. And this is important as we continue to focus on America uh, for exponential growth. There are deals that we have won in North America, which included uh, large managed services deals. And uh, when we say managed services, we are differentiating in the market with our cloud and SaaS-based managed services model, um, as well as um, integrated uh, you know, deals in that area. We also... Um, had uh, two or three marquee logos in uh, in North America uh, related to Oracle Cloud. Uh, one of them was a large uh, trucking and uh, logistics company, which uh, uh, which is a fresh implementation of a multi-tower Oracle Cloud, uh, and and also uh, significant more potential in the digital services uh, in in that organization. We also uh, built on one of the successful implementation and go live at the healthcare group. It is a provider to uh, local healthcare agencies and hospitals. And this is another strategic one because we implemented uh, Oracle Cloud in that organization. And now we have won the follow on managed services deal with that same organization. So this is an example of how we are building on not just implementation, but also downstream work in uh, post our implementation. Moving on to uh, our um, digital services business in the US, there has been significant traction around uh, D2X and our digital commerce space. As you know, the October, November, December quarter is a very heavy holiday season quarter. Uh, it has a seasonality effect for us uh, because of holidays, but it also is a very critical period for our retail and e-commerce customers. There has been uh, about eight or nine significant uh, go lives, but also more importantly, we are playing a role in not just uh, supporting e-commerce sites, but helping our clients increase their revenue, increase their orders and transactions, as well as looking at how they can improve conversions and uh, attract more guests in their uh, websites. So this is particularly exciting because uh, as more and more organizations, not just in the retail space, but also in manufacturing and other industries, move their business online, we have the experience and credibility to scale and make business impact and business outcomes uh, for them. There is one particular deal that I want to mention in the Americas, which is again an integrated deal. This, When I say integrated deal, we have combined the power of our digital front office as well as our Oracle Cloud back office. Along with some uh, you know, digital development in the API and microservices world. So this particular deal is, is with a marketing and uh, media company where we are going to do an entire lead to cash transformation from front office to back office, which includes not just Oracle, but includes Salesforce and other technologies as well. This is particularly exciting because this, again, demonstrates the combined power of our Ivasis acquisition 
and how we are incorporating that into every deal. Hopefully that gives a flavor for uh, some of the deals that we have won. There is more de uh, details on other uh, wins we've had across UK, Middle East, as well as uh, America. Uh, we announced uh, this week that we have opened a center in Romania. This is uh, a strategic move as well as we continue to see traction in the Europe uh, segment, particularly in Nordics and uh, Netherlands. And uh, this will provide us the ability to cater to uh, languages as well as grow in the Europe market in the future. All in all, uh, business across geographies and segments was uh, on the uptick in our order booking. Uh, we did have seasonality, as I mentioned, and furloughs, uh, obviously, uh, currency impact from a UK perspective. Uh, but uh, we are looking um, forward with confidence uh, given the demand uh, and the pipeline that we have uh, in all across all those uh, geographies. Coming on to a very strategic topic on people and talent, there is um, definitely challenges around the industry, as you know, on attrition. And we have communicated that we are um, engaged in about five to seven very strategic initiatives around talent. And uh, this goes all the way from uh, employee people experience to uh, skill transformation to different ways uh, in attracting talent. We have started to release um, an update on our brand positioning. You'll see more of that in the coming weeks. But employer brand and our positioning in the market is equally important from an employee perspective. And uh, we're focused on our employee value proposition as well as talent, and that is paying off. Uh, where we are able to provide differentiated work and uh, faster career growth and path. And uh, we've seen that uh, in our ability to attract talent. Uh, this quarter, which is uh, the Q3, was one of our uh, best quarters when it comes to number of people and the hiring and the onboarding. Um, most uh, companies are doing that, but we have ramped up on our fresher hiring, as well as uh, you know our combination of fresher and lateral hiring is uh, going to position us in Q4 and beyond. We uh, are taking uh, steps to manage the attrition and retention uh, while uh, improving our ability to uh, increase our recruiting to uh, cater to the demand uh, that I mentioned earlier. There are two uh, executive leaders that we have hired, uh, among many other leaders who have joined uh, MassTech in Q3. Uh, across the board, uh, we've gotten some interesting talent from the industry. Uh, these are from large companies and uh, even in some cases from uh, leading edge startups that we are able to attract into mass tech. And uh, the uh, head of marketing and partnerships has joined us. She came from Capgemini. Uh, we have also going to be announcing that we have hired a head of innovation and uh, technology. And this will chart our uh, ambition of uh, creating non-linear platforms and differentiated growth uh, going into uh, the next three years. Let me move on quickly to our strategic vision and progress around that, and uh, then I'll hand it over to Arun. We have uh, indicated uh, a few big bets, and I'll just cover them very quickly. Happy to uh, answer any questions around that uh, in our Q&A. But our uh, strategic priorities have been under four and, you know, four plus one, I'll say, uh, big blocks. The first one is around the America's geography. And uh, hopefully you're seeing that uptick in momentum, but we are particularly excited about the pipeline as well as on the order book side. Like I mentioned, uh, we expect that to continue to grow uh, in this quarter and beyond. The second is around uh, data and automation. Again, you'll see that reflected in our results. We've been able to significantly increase our uh, share in the data and automation space. I think this is going to be important as we look at the next three years we believe that this era is going to be in the data pipeline and how um, data is going to move into the cloud. So as Mastic is mostly a digital and cloud business, we have the unique ability to uh, uh, focus on this area and also take a head start, not just within uh, organically, but even potentially through partnerships in inorganic means. Our healthcare um, focus that we have communicated in the last couple of calls is now uh, starting to pay off. Uh, we are hyper-focused on this industry cluster because we do see the demand, but also we have certain solutions and differentiators that we are able to win uh, across geographies, not just NHS, but even in Americas as well as in uh, in Middle East. Our innovation focus is, is going to be critical, but uh, our ability to 
partner uh, has significantly increased uh, in addition to Oracle Cloud where we are dominating uh, the partnership. Uh, we are the only company that has been listed as part of our Ivisys, um, uh, you know, umbrella where it is the only uh, the only company that is listed in the Oracle website as an organization that uh, competes with SAP. This is important because of our focus, uh, where Oracle is able to bring us in into deals uh, proactively, and uh, it is helping um, now create larger deals as well in the uh, upper mid-market and even in the Fortune 1000 space. The last point I'll say is again on talent and people. I cannot stress on this enough. We have, uh, I'm very pleased with the change that we had made in the previous quarter where we uh, integrated all our recruiting elements together into one function called Global Workforce Management. And that is starting to pay off. Um, you'll see that in the Q4 hiring as well, where we look at a uh, significant uh, number of freshers as well as laterals as we grow uh, you know, for the next uh, three years. But more importantly, uh, we are differentiating when it comes to employee experience as well. And um, that is important from a talent attraction, but also from a talent retention perspective. We uh, have also uh, been focusing on one more strategic area at a corporate level, which is ESG. Um, we've also, uh, uh, we also have plans to announce certain things and be listed on the Dow Sustainability Index, and, and uh, you'll see that in the next quarter announcement. But I wanted to give you that uh, heads up because uh, as it relates to environment, sustainability, social values, governance, um, you've always known MathTech uh, to lead uh, the way and we continue to do that in addition to our work with, uh, you know, uh, on the social and the foundation side. Uh, with that, um, to wrap up my session, um, I think, again, on the financial metric side, uh, on the business commentary, as well as the uh, people and talent and the strategic vision, uh, in that context, we are uh, confident about uh, the growth in Q4 as well as going forward for the next three years as we execute on our strategic plan. I'm going to hand it over to our CFO, Global CFO, Arun Agarwal. Thank you. Thanks, Udal. It's quite, quite, quite a comprehensive summary. Uh, gives a 360 degree view in terms of different initiatives which the company is driving. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone on the call. Q3 was another quarter of our consistent financial performance. We are seeing positive order book momentum, as mentioned by Hiral, um, in our key markets, UK and US, followed by Europe, in our key verticals, government and healthcare and life sciences, and in our focused service line, data automation and AI, together with uh, Oracle Cloud and Enterprise App, while others continue to deliver on expected lines. Revenue for the quarter was $73.6 million, reflecting growth of 3.7% quarter-on-quarter and 20.9% year-on-year in constant currency terms. In INA terms, it was 551.9 crores, up by 3.4% quarter-on-quarter and 24.6% year-on-year. Operating margin for the company stood at 21.1% for the quarter, flat uh, when you compare to quarter two. Uh, I would like to stress and, and give a perspective while we continue to invest in talent retention, hiring and training the freshers, and continue to hire laterals given current attrition scenario, we have been able to maintain healthy operating EBITDA margin on the back of operating levers and NGNA reallocations, an initiative which Mastek is running from last four years to ensure we deliver the quality of earning. As I mentioned about the healthy momentum in order book, has the same has been reflected into our 12-month order backlog. We closed the quarter with $171 million, reflecting 9.9% increase quarter-on-quarter quarter and 33.7% increase year-on-year year in constant currency terms. Our PAT stood at 83.5 crores, up 2.4% quarter-on-quarter and 18.7% year-on-year. Coming very closing to certain balance sheet uh, items, Closing cash was 932.3 crores versus 943.9 crores in the previous quarter. Just to highlight, during the quarter, we have discharged part consideration for CCPS buyout to the tune of 29 crores. We have also paid uh, FI21 final dividend in the current quarter, which was in the range of 27 crores. <coughs> we discharged one installment of uh, loan in the UK, which was coming up for, for uh, on a timely installment terms has been paid in the current quarter. 
Our free cash flow was 77.2% of net income for the period nine months ended December 2021. During the quarter, we have added 25 new customers and, and most, most important seven of which have revenue, their, their revenue in, in greater than 1 billion in, in, in size, which again creates multiple options as, as Hiral alluded to, whereby we can go and do a lot of cross-selling, co-selling because they come with very high uh, IT wallet in terms of spend. Our average deal sizes are increasing as we are participating in more multi-million and multi-year dollar deals on the basis of comprehensive and integrated solutioning, including Oracle Cloud and Master Digital Services. Our closing headcount for the quarter was 4785, reflecting net addition of 275 resources during the quarter. Very quickly, reflecting on the geography performance, our UK and Europe business grew 2.3% quarter on quarter, despite furlough and seasonal impact. While public sector and health care continue to grow quarter on quarter in UK, we saw reduction in private sector revenue led by fewer project completions and go live and further impacted by seasonal leaves and the furlough. As Hidal alluded to, during the quarter, we have secured one of the highest orders, $60 million plus from the NHS. And just to highlight and, and, and we go back to our last 12 months of conversation, we have been, we had been onboarded by NHS as one of the 12 service providers under 800 million framework. This is the example of the deal which is coming out of that framework. We believe many more to come. And this was the size we were looking for, as we mentioned in the last uh, quarter call. And I'm quite happy to announce finally we have got it. In terms of UK geography, our year on year growth was 23.8%. Moving quickly to US as a geography, our quarter quarter growth was 5.1%, coupled with strong order book in healthcare and other verticals across Oracle and digital services. As Viral mentioned, it is one of our biggest quarter in terms of order book in North America region for Oracle cloud business. Year-on-year -year growth in the US was 30.7% during the quarter. India grew 6.6% quarter on quarter and 21.2% year-on-year, led by strong execution. Oracle and enterprise apps continue to grow healthy, led by cloud transformation and managed service engagement. And I would like to highlight, uh, we have uh, reshaped some of our offerings we have, had, we have uh, coined a, a terminology called Application Enhancement Services, AES, we call it internally. We have any multi-million dollar and multi-year engagement under this, this, this offering. And the uniqueness of this offering is it's, on the, it's, it's created on the base of value-based delivery, quite similar to what we are doing under implementation services. What it does to customers, through automation, we are reducing the number of incidences which is coming for the you know, kind of error situation or, or different not so comfortable situation for the user. As we bring those incidents down, more time can be can be spent in terms of enhancement of services. And hence clients see better return on their investment. And at the same time, as we are spending more time in terms of automation, it's opening up new business opportunity as 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 we are getting into data automation and AI relating to the cloud offering and services. Just to end the conversation. And uh, there are two more call-outs very quick. One, we have declared interim dividend of rupees seven per share, uh, which is 140% of our face value of share price. Also, as, as Hiral alluded to, we have opened our uh, near show center in Romania to accelerate our expansion in continental Europe and also support as a near show center for UK and other markets. Thank you everyone for, for your time and, and the opportunity and your continued trust and support to Mastech. Let me hand over the mic back to the moderator and open the house for Q&A. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touch one telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. First question is from the line of Vedic Sarkar from Unify Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, gentlemen, uh, in the context of the environment, uh, I guess one expected much better numbers. Uh, so this is a bit uh, underwhelming. Uh, I have more than a few questions, so let's just stay with this until we're done. I'll go practice line-wise. 
Uh, Hiral, uh, the, the digital commerce and experience uh, vertical, I'm assuming, is largely uh, US-led and uh, it's back in the digital territory. Uh, if I could request you a frank assessment of what exactly is happening in the US market now. Uh, I understand the right to win might be limited, might be constrained by our size, and uh, we've been making investments in leadership to that extent for several years now. How should we realistically imagine this vertical? And let's not address this with the blue sky scenario because we know how rapid the blue sky is. Uh, please give us a realistic assessment of how we should imagine this, the risks to education, and why you feel this will break out, or I mean, if at all you think it will. Uh, and I repeat, no, no macros. So uh, thanks for the question, Vedic. Um, I was able to hear you fine, but uh, your voice was a little bit uh, unclear, although I did get the gist of the question. Uh, so let me uh, answer it, and then uh, you can clarify if there's uh, certain things that, that uh, were not answered. Um, again, I think it was just a combination of the digital commerce experience in the U.S. in the context of Americas. So um, there is uh, two or three things when it comes to the, the whole digital commerce and experience space. One is the specific commerce itself, right, where we do a lot of uh, business managing uh, as well as developing and operating websites and helping our customers grow in the uh, online space. There is also certain elements of uh, imagining their customer journey as it relates to front office transformation. So this includes sales, services, marketing. And then Oracle also has a CX component of the business, which is uh, uh, what they call the Oracle CX, which is now integrated in, in their uh, uh, portfolio, uh, which includes uh, CPQ uh, and uh, CRM uh, from an Oracle perspective. So when we uh, reclassified this particular line item on the Oracle, uh, on, the, on the digital commerce and experience side, it includes the Oracle components as well. So that is point number one. The, the commerce and experience part of Oracle, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to. In that context, um, the majority of the customers that we've had in the past have been retail um, and consumer type of customers. This is, again, going back uh, over the last couple of years. But what is happening now is the same experience of B2C and the same movement uh, of uh, e-commerce transformation is getting applied to uh, other industries as well. It could be manufacturing industries, it could be even financial industries or healthcare industries. And this is where we have uh, coined a differentiated uh, approach and framework called D2X, which is direct to stakeholder. And this is giving us the ability not just to look at direct to consumer, but direct to supplier, direct to partner, direct to any other stakeholder um, that a customer deals with. So this is just a, the business framework in, in which we're operating that. Um, uh, America's, when we look at uh, this particular practice and this particular service line, we have started to win deals in Australia, in Middle East, as well as in, in UK. So it is no longer just a, purely America's uh, business, so that's point number one. Point number two is now we are able to take that element of front office, which is combined with all the things I talked about, and have, in approaches, have integrated approaches where we can combine CX, uh, digital commerce, as well as back office. The example of the deal I gave earlier on uh, the marketing and uh, uh, advertising media company, is actually combining Salesforce uh, as well as Oracle back office. So this is this is how we look at it. Uh, there is going to be uh, December is going to be a challenging quarter for this business in particular uh, because uh, of the holiday season as well as uh, there is no new development uh, that typically customers do in November and December, and this is pretty standard across the industry. I've seen this in the last 15 years, and uh, the reason for that is the focus is really to uh, you know on the on the sales to execute the orders to look at transactions to improve the volumes. So you'll see a little bit of a challenge when it comes to this particular line item in Q3, but uh, this is a business that we are very confident that will continue to uh, grow on an absolute basis. So hopefully that answered uh, the question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Debashesh Mazunda from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for taking my question. So uh, this is a continuation of a question I asked uh, in the last quarter call also. Uh, if I uh, see and connect the dots of the tax sheet numbers that you have announced, 
it is very clear that we have certain amount of uh, lesser growth or degrowth we are seeing in the private uh, customers in the Europe market. And uh, this, uh, in the context, I'm asking because uh, all of our larger peers become very, very active in uh, Europe market. So, uh, is it like are we losing certain amount of market share with the private players in the Europe market? Because uh, if I see across segments, uh, whether that is retail, manufacturing, energy, services, everywhere we have reported the growth and uh, government has comparatively done well for us. So I'm assuming that Europe uh, private segment has uh, not done well for us in this quarter. So are you seeing any trend here? Is it a one-time play which is expected to come back in next few quarters? And how do you want to see it? Sure, uh, Devish, I think it's a good question. Um, let me um, uh, divide it into two parts. Uh, yes, when it comes to Q3, the, the private sector uh, revenue on, on uh, just a pure uh, number basis uh, had a challenge and, and we grew, but uh, that was something that we expected going into Q3. Uh, part of it is, of course, uh, furloughs and, and uh, the seasonality, but you know, part of it is few uh, projects getting uh, uh, completed as well. Now, having said that, uh, this is an important part of our strategy, and, and obviously we want to show this and execute uh, on the on the promise when it comes to private sector. Uh, but but we are still taking a focused uh, approach here. We are not going to go into too many different verticals when it comes to private sector in, in the UK market. Uh, our focus uh, has been on uh, the microfinance and uh, the financial services components uh, or part of the financial services vertical. Uh, we've also focused on retail um, and, and consumer sectors in, in the UK. And we're starting to see uh, a little bit traction in, in one or two other verticals. But if I look at uh, uh, going forward in, in terms of private, this is definitely not a pattern. Uh, we do have a uh, uh, good pipeline and, and actually some good traction building in uh, the verticals I mentioned about. Um, in fact, we're expecting a very uh, healthy order book um, you know, three of the medium-sized deals that uh, we were expecting uh, to close this current quarter, this is Q4, we've actually closed two of them already in the UK private sector. So it's definitely not a pattern. Having said that, we have a low base out there. And uh, we do have to uh, create a, a stronger value proposition uh, so that we can go into the, the, uh, the larger segment and deals. And that's the reason for our very focused approach. Um, because we believe if we are able to differentiate in certain uh, verticals and certain value propositions, we'll be able to uh, scale up eventually. A uh, couple of the other comments I made around managed services, around integrated deals applies to that sector as well. Uh, and we're starting to see now pipeline with integrated deals where uh, we are able to cross-sell into accounts where we've had Oracle uh, or vice versa, where we've had uh, certain digital engineering work and we're able to cross-sell uh, Oracle Cloud. So hopefully you'll see more more there on the private sector in UK. Uh, the results right now don't uh, demonstrate that, but uh, we don't see that as a pattern, and there's uh, uh, definitely it's part of our three-year strategy in terms of the growth engine. Yeah, uh, one one related uh, extension to extension to this, we recently had a uh, leadership change. Not recent, I mean it's become more than one year now. Uh, leadership change in the Europe market, and then uh, you also joined as a new leader in the company. So, is there any change in strategy in the Europe market that is uh, affecting our short term performance and uh, that will turn back? Is it something linked to that? Uh, so, Devishik, I think we communicated this last time. The, the main reason for the dip was uh, one particular account where the, uh, the, the wins and the new deals that we were able to close. Um, was not fast enough in, in time to to really balance out the ramp downs and the projects that were completed in NHS, right? And we were very transparent on that even in the last quarter uh, call. Yeah. So um, yeah. Abhishek, who joined uh, the UK, uh, actually is physically located to the UK uh, region uh, three months, four months back, uh, is doing a fantastic job. Uh, actually, um, he's valued the teams very well, taking a much more uh, strategic and integrated approach. And uh, that's uh, what's reflecting in some of these uh, wins and, and order book as well. So, um, yeah, we, we don't see any kind of leadership uh, challenges. In fact, uh, we're very happy with uh, how uh, UK has come back uh, strongly. 
uh, in, in Q3 from an order book uh, momentum perspective. And we see that reflecting in revenue growth uh, in the coming quarters as well. You know, I, I was not alluding to a leadership challenge. I was trying to understand that whether there is any strategic call that you have taken in leaving few clients or leaving few deals because of lesser profitability or something. That is what I'm trying to understand. It is not the leadership sure. challenge. Yeah, there, there is no, there is no, there is no uh, strategic uh, change in terms of uh, defocusing on. Uh, what we have, because we are actually already very focused in UK, right? We're focused on uh, public sector, we're focused on NHS, and we're focused on certain verticals in the uh, uh, in the private sector. The the strategic call uh, is on two areas. One is uh, the traction that we are seeing in the Europe market, which uh, is outside of UK. Uh, we're starting to see some good momentum where Oracle is getting us in there. And so we are evaluating that market uh, more holistically uh, before uh, in a bigger way. So that is point. Uh, point number two is uh, we are looking selectively at accounts in the Middle East, right? Given our ability now to get into Fortune 1000 customers and larger clients across the board, on some of the smaller clients and the smaller deals. And by design, uh, we've looked at that particularly in Middle East, not UK, particularly in Middle East, where we want to focus on lesser number of clients, but more higher quality revenue, because we are seeing our ability to increase the deal size as well as engage with other customers. So um, otherwise, other than that, there is no uh, major change in uh, UK strategy. Excellent. Uh, one uh, last question around attrition. Uh, although on an LTM basis, uh, attrition has gone up, that is visible. Uh, but do you think, uh, do you see actual number of people churning uh, is coming down or uh, stabilizing at a certain point so that uh, in, in percentage term it's still going to reflect in next two, three quarters down the line? Are you seeing that trend happening? Yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we should have probably covered that. But um, the quarter-on-quarter uh, quarter attrition has actually stabilized for us. Uh, in fact, it was uh, flat. And uh, this is an important uh, a part of our retention and an experience uh, focus when it comes to employees because while the last 12 months, like you said, has increased, uh, but uh, if you look at it from a Q2 to Q3 perspective, that has been flat and stabilized. So we do see that coming under some level of uh, control and hopefully reducing, uh, you know, after Q1 onwards. Uh, but, you know, the talent market is hot, as you know, and uh, we continue to do everything possible uh, to focus on retention. Great. Thank you very much for answering my question and uh, congratulations for a very strong order book edition and deal edition that was done in this quarter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in conference, please limit our question to two per participant. If time permits, you may join the queue for any follow up. The next question is from the line of Madhu Babu from Canada HSBC. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, based on this uh, new NHS deal, so should we have a good 4Q? Because last two quarters have been soft. So should we be back to like, you know, 6 7% kind of quarter on quarter growth in 4Q? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you know, Madhu, we don't uh, guide right now when it comes to quarter on quarter or uh, revenue numbers, but uh, we're um, confident about uh, delivering uh, numbers in that range. Uh, given that our uh, order book has been strong across geographies as well as uh, some of the dips that we experienced in Q2 and Q3 are now behind us. So, um, you know, there's always risks in the business, but um, as it stands today, Q4 is definitely looking uh, much better. Uh, and sir, with this referral in NHS, it's such a large deal. So are we uh, in advanced status with any other large departments in UK government? Like, I mean, uh, we, we deal with multiple other departments in UK, right? And so are we in advanced status with any other, uh, you know, in terms of getting any large deal there? Thanks. Yeah, sure. So, so you know, why we focus on NHS, uh, but uh, there is uh, definitely uh, some significant momentum uh, when it comes to the uh, our engagement with the army, uh, when it comes uh, uh, with our engagement with uh, some of the existing immigration and other offices that we uh, deal with. Uh, there is also uh, the vehicle uh, uh, certification uh, agency that we have 
uh, won some deals and there are some city councils uh, on the government side that we also won some deals. So um, there is one uh, new department and institution that we've engaged in. We believe that uh, that could be a, a pretty big game changer in the coming um, uh, fiscal year if we are able to grow in that account. Um, so we're still stra scratching the surface when it comes to our penetration in some of these larger uh, spends. Um, so, so we do want to focus on mining and growing some of the existing uh, accounts that we have. But yes, there is uh, uh, two or three new institutions that we've won, uh, which definitely present us the opportunity to grow in, uh, in, in the future. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Manoj Paheti from Carnelian Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, hi. Uh, good evening to you and uh, to the entire master team. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate, uh, congratulate you uh, for good set of number and good deal wins. So I have a couple of questions. First one is, uh, if I look at uh, uh, your disclosure in the press release, like if you have, uh, you have added around 25 new clients, but your active clients uh, uh, this last quarter is down from 447 to 421. And secondly, despite of 60 million uh, win last year, your uh, 12 months order backlog, it has gone up from 155 million to 171 million. So how do I uh, read uh, these uh, 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 two things here? Uh, sure. So, so let me start, and then I'll have uh, Arun also add in. Uh, there are two uh, parts adding to that question. So, what um, you know, if you look at our kind of overall client mix um, relative to many of our competitors in, in the same sort of segment or even slightly larger uh, companies, uh, our uh, the number of clients that we have is actually significantly higher, right? Uh, now, this has uh, certain advantages, and that's a different part of the strategy that we're going to execute on, on how we cater to those clients. But um, there is also uh, you know, our ability to move into the upper mid-market and Fortune 1000 customers that is paying off. So we do believe that uh, there is an advantage in focusing on uh, lesser number of clients uh, as a whole, and uh, particularly in certain geographies like Middle East, where we believe there's opportunities in some of the existing customers, we don't have to necessarily go after every single client or every single deal. So you're seeing that uh, reflect in, in the new clients and the uh, active clients as well, where if there is a project or a small uh, engagement uh, with a client that uh, you know is, is uh, small in size, we have not put our efforts into renewing anything there. Instead, we're focusing on some of the larger deals and larger clients, right? So that is, that is the answer to the first part of the question. Mm -hmm. um, Arun, you want to quickly comment on the order book, and then I can add if you want. Very, very quickly. So Manoj, uh, interesting point. Uh, but to rehash, if you're referring to $60 million deal, uh, that is the four-year dollar deal, which we, four -year, uh, deal which we have received. Our focus is more in terms of getting long-term multi-million dollar contracts, which keep better visibility in terms of, you know, revenue profile as we get into. And as we are getting, as, as we are alluded to, as we are getting into large uh, value deals with upper mid-market or, or Fortune 1000 customers, that's the profile which we are targeting. However, what it does, uh, the whole order book may not reflect in 12 months number because because a long, long tail to execute. I hope uh, that helps, Manoj. Okay, so it is uh, next 12 months order backlog, right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So it, it won't include entire 60 million, right? Absolutely, got it. Right. Got it. Got it. So, uh, my second question is, if I look at the attrition and looking at the kind of talent walk which industry is facing, so uh, uh, are you also likely to see some kind of margin pressure or uh, uh, you are able to pass through the incremental cost to the client? So if you can give some perspective on that. Thank you. So maybe, yeah, let me take it. Yeah. So, so Manoj, pretty, pretty nice question again. Uh, we are seeing there's a good churn, good attrition which is happening. Uh, we are investing into talent, hiring pressures, training them. We are hiring laterals as well. The wage curve is going up. 
But again, in terms of price increase, there are two factors which will happen in a short to medium term. You will be able to pass on certain price increase and some of some of the price increase you need to bear at the company level. However, we believe our margin profile currently we are what in the range of 21% operating EBITDA. There yes. could be downside, but but we are not expecting any significant uh, reduction in the margin profile in the medium term. However, you know the whole 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 approach is how can we keep working on the operating levers, keep uh, supporting the operating operating levers to give better margin improvement, which we can reinvest one for your wage hike and second for the purpose of the investment which we need to drive to uh, to to grow better than the industry. So it's a combination which we are working on, Manoj, and we believe uh, you know not not a significant erosion which we expect in in medium term at least. Great, thanks thanks for my take, for taking my question. I wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Romil Jain from Electron Portfolio Managers. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, so can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, sir. Uh, so uh, one question is uh, just want to understand, you know, because we are uh, in many geographies, you know, Europe, uh, UK, as well as US now. So, uh, any major geographical, uh, you know, margin differentiation that we have, uh, or across, you know, uh, or it would be in the similar band. Again, Rumi's margin, yeah, margin profile. See again, uh, in the in the developed market, the margin profiles are much more, uh, much much better. If you get into UK, US, even Europe. And depending upon the nature of services which you deliver and which must take specifically in the digital transformation space where we operate, we we, we have uh, quite greater range of margin. However, if you get into Middle East or APEC kind of region, you might feel the quality of thing is not that great. But if you ask me UK, US, and Europe, uh, they would be quite pretty similar. And the customers care for quality of service and not worried with the with the right price. So we don't see that much of challenge in the developed market. Okay. I, I, I want to make one, uh, one more comment on that. Uh, part of our strategy to focus on higher quality revenue and lesser number of accounts in Middle East is also connected to that point. Uh, so, so if you look at that as a whole, uh, it should help us not just uh, have larger customers, but better margins eventually in Middle East as well. Okay. Got it. Uh, secondly, on the uh, uh, you know the other expenses that we have, so I think they are in the range of 29, 30 percent right now. Uh, uh, and so, do we see any any lever you know going ahead? Maybe not in one quarter or two quarters, but going ahead, uh, uh, we can play around and you know try to reduce that. Lumit, I missed out. Uh, when did you say 29, 30 uh, percent? Which... Yeah, the other expenses, uh, you know, the other expenses uh, which are there, so around 29 to 30 percent of revenue. Uh, any levers that, you know, we can reduce those in future? Yeah, Lumit. So there, there, there are multiple uh, aspects. Let me give you one very quick um, margin improvement lever which we keep working internally. Uh, typically, those subcontractors and the contractors which you hire in the overseas market and some in the local market as well. Uh, gets recorded under other expenses as a line. One of the lever which we work as a management uh, holistically is to convert those subcontractors into employees, and therefore you can reduce the cost. However, the cost is kept from other cost, other expenses to the salary, but yes, the margin profile will improve. But again, it's a, it's, it's a little medium term journey, uh, uh, Romic, to be honest, because at the moment we are seeing a significant uh, you know, requirement for the talent. And therefore, uh, you know, whether you get as an employee or you get as a subcontractor, the important point is you should be able to serve your customers and so that customer is happy and you can keep growing your revenue. So that, that's more of a mid-term to uh, little, little, you know, uh, year-to-year strategy to keep converting, reducing your other costs and, and offsetting that, the same with the employee cost. So acquisitions, you know, that we were planning, um, have we on something, you know, maybe a couple of them. Uh, any updates? So, uh, let me take that and um, you can add. So, we um, have actually now formed um, um, a cross functional team to focus on uh, MA. We're also uh, seeing this as a continuum from a build, buy, and partner perspective. And when I say that, there are certain areas that we are going to organically create and build or strengthen. There are certain places where we will partner uh, with the broader ecosystem. And there are certain uh, areas that we will acquire. And we've been 
um, again, uh, transparent on those areas as well. It will be around uh, CX and uh, customer engagement. It will be around our cloud platform strategy as well as the data and intelligent automation uh, space. Uh, you know, around few leading platforms, um, particularly with focus on healthcare and life sciences and a few other verticals. So um, we've scanned multiple assets over the last uh, three, four months. Uh, we continue to have uh, uh, detailed discussions on on, uh, on some of them. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, in the next couple of months, uh, we'll get into some level of uh, maturity with, uh, I mean, it's taken a little bit longer than we expected. Um, there is a lot of good, uh, uh, the market is good, uh, the valuations are high. Uh, but uh, we've been able to narrow it down to a focused set of uh, targets, and and uh, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a it's a journey. Uh, it's not going to be a one-time journey. Uh, this is part of our strategy for the next three years as well. We will be very selective and focused when it comes to M&A. Hearing more uh, in the in the next quarter on this. Thank you. Before we move to the next question, I'd like to remind the participants to limit your question to two per participant. If time permits, you may join the queue for follow-up. The next question is on the line of Sunil Kotari from Unique PMS. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, uh, compared to last two years, I think slowly uh, we are, it seems that, that uh, investor is feeling that uh, we are losing some momentum. So, looking at your objective, which we uh, elaborated during last annual report of uh, uh, achieving some numbers by another three year and six and seven years, uh, what are the hurdles which you would like to overcome to enhance and build again the confidence of the investor community? Because we have, if you look at the last quarter's number, this quarter's numbers, on the numbers, people always are getting disappointed because of maybe a little bit uh, higher expectation or uh, compared to other uh, industry players, the way they are uh, performing. So one is my question is, uh, what what are the challenges would you would like to overcome in maybe near term and medium term to enhance and build again this confidence? And second question is, looking at the demand scenario, uh, looking at the cost which is going up uh, of the employees and <coughs> this uh, high attrition, do you see any pricing power coming back to industry, uh, or maybe in a medium term? These are my two questions. Okay. So then I, I was able to hear, uh, it was not fully clear, but I got, I got the list of the questions. And, and Aruna can start if you want, and um, you feel free to add. Um, so, um, see, as we look at the next uh, two or three years, I mean, you mentioned about the, the broader ambition from our annual report as well as uh, our overall 2025-2026 uh, type of uh, vision. There is uh, a few levers that uh, and a few strategic pillars that, that we've been focused on, right? And we'll uh, continue to build on that and, and continue to communicate very transparently and progress around that. Um, I think uh, uh, capabilities and uh, uh, service offerings is something that we are very closely looked at. Uh, there is a lot of uh, good history and, and uh, track record of very strong delivery at MassTech. And uh, we believe that that's an advantage that we have not leveraged enough. Um, you know, we have some really high impact uh, business value stories that we plan to get to the market and uh, very excited about uh, our new marketing leader coming on board officially uh, so that we can take that forward. Uh, but um, as it comes to the service offerings, um, we have now uh, uh, created uh, what we call as level three, level four uh, value propositions, which um, can truly differentiate uh, when it comes to customer engagements and competitive scenarios, right? Um, as you know, given our uh, uh, differentiate when it comes to um, uh, you know, deals, particularly the larger deals. And so this was one challenge that, that we saw, and uh, we have been working on strengthening the capabilities and uh, making it much more next generation uh, so that we can compete not just in uh, addressing the challenge of customers today, but also how they can get transformed tomorrow, right? Because most of the, our customer base uh, is moving to the cloud. So when we say managed services, we actually don't talk about on-premise managed services as much. We actually talk about the SaaS and the cloud-based managed services. Our ability to take 
uh, you know, accelerate their transformation in the cloud, particularly with their digital and cloud landscape. So, so we're addressing some of these capabilities and offerings in a slightly different lens uh, that paves the way for not just today, but for the next few years to come. So that's, that's you know, one point number one. Um, I, I do believe that the people retention and the attrition challenge uh, will continue for the next two, three quarters. Um, like I said, we're seeing stabilization on uh, our end, at least, when it comes to quarter on quarter, and we believe that we'll continue to uh, get better uh, in, the, in the coming quarters as well. Uh, but uh, as it relates to people, the one challenge which, frankly, the industry has is the gap between demand and supply mismatch. And when I see that, you know, customers have significantly started to look at how they're going to transform and how, in some cases, they're catching up, in some cases, they're accelerating. And because of this, the type of skills, what we call as future skills, um, that is expected in each engagement um, is very different from what it was even two, three years back, right? So our engine and ability to not just recruit, but cross-skill and cross-train is going to be even more important. Now, fortunately, we've had a very strong uh, record with our images and cloud business already. Uh, we have now taken that across the company and uh, implemented it across the key big bet areas that we focused on. So if you ask me, um, you know, of course, there are challenges when it comes to the macro environment and political risks and specific geographies. Uh, there's always going to be some element of risks on m and but, but, you know, if we are able to address these two areas around service capability differentiation and, and people uh, and getting them ready for future skills, I think we have all the ingredients as Mastec uh, to de deliver on the promise. So we're yeah, very confident going into uh, the next fiscal year. Um, given our pipeline and other book uh, that we've been able to demonstrate. But um, these are the two areas that we've been uh, trying to strengthen over the last few months. Very quickly to add, Sunil, as you, as you asked for demand, uh, employee cost, the attrition, as I mentioned earlier, yes, uh, there's, there's an attrition which is which the industry itself is facing. We are doing multiple initiatives, as Siddharth alluded to, in terms of retention strategies. Uh, and we are ramping up our capability to hire people as we onboarded significant count of people this quarter and we continue to increase uh, the count as we are growing our, our revenue. However, yes, the cost, uh, we believe there is a pressure to be cost, but there are multiple operating levers where we work for. There could be dilution in margin, but not significant as we expect, uh, as operating levers is going to offset some of the cost increase and some of the cost increase, we should be easily pass, uh, pass it over to the client as well. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Amar Morya from our Sacred Advisors. Please go ahead. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Please go ahead. Yeah. So thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, so Hiral, my question is more to understand, uh, as you indicated that, you know, uh, we had one uh, pretty integrated deal in the US geography. So how basically, you know, going forward in next 12 to 18 months, so overall deal pipeline uh, is going to build up in US. Uh, that is number one. Number two, uh, Arun, if you can also indicate that, you know, in terms of your 12 month order book, uh, what would be like, you know, uh, the increase in the order book from the US geography, if you can split it, this order book into the US and others? These are two questions. So let me let me take the first, and then Arun, if you want to take the second. So, um, uh, the, the pipeline that we have today is actually the highest we've had, and uh, part of it is uh, related to the larger uh, deal sizes and and so the larger customers that we're engaging in. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, just to stress again, the the order book that we had in North America last quarter in Q3 was was the strongest, and and. Uh, as we look at the deal pipeline in terms of not just the size of the deals, but the type of deals, right? Uh, whether it's end-to-end -end process transformation, whether it's cloud SaaS managed services, whether it is integrated deals in terms of the types of technologies, it's not just in one or two areas or, you know, we talked about the deal uh, which had Salesforce and Oracle, but these, there are technologies that you're seeing, you know, there are deals with service now, for example, or Snowflake. So, uh, we are seeing uh, different types of deals, uh, but our value proposition um, that we're taking to the customers in the U.S. is starting to resonate. 
um, because we have an integrated uh, proposition around D2X, but we have now expanded that uh, to certain process areas. You know, the example I gave on lead to cash order transformation uh, is, is one such example, but we look at that industry by industry, we have an opportunity to differentiate. So pipeline-wise, um, we expect Americas to continue to grow uh, fairly um, uh, significantly and, and uh, in a differentiated manner. Um, the people and the hiring that we have done, uh, even including some uh, uh, heavy hitters and, and experienced people in, in the coming from the industry, uh, will also support that group. And uh, you should see continued uh, traction when it comes to uh, not just pipeline, but order book as well as revenue uh, in the Americas. Uh, Arun, if you want to take the second one. Yeah, very quickly, uh, again, we don't keep breakup geography-wise, but quickly, uh, it's in the range of uh, 7 to 8% increase in 12 months order backlog quarter on quarter. You know, my context is like, you know, when you say that uh, the large deal pipelines or large size deal pipeline in the US, so like, you know, uh, the quantum of uh, or the size which we are like you know, we recently won in UK, uh, probably larger size, kind of a $60 million or $40 million. So those kind of deals are also uh, like in the pipeline or in the discussion in US? You know, let me clarify that. I mean, it's a good point. Uh, when we say uh, large deals in the US, uh, I want and I gave this context, uh, I think, in the last call and some of the questions as well. Um, historically, uh, you know, our deal sizes in the U.S., if you, you know, rewind back maybe about a year or year and a half, uh, were in the 500K range. Right? If, you, if you really go back in 2020, uh, a large deal in the U.S. market for Massex was 500K. Uh, so in that context, the, the point I want to stress on is compared to some of the larger framework deals and the larger uh, opportunities in public sector and health sector in UK, that is not a comparable size for uh, uh, the Americas. Having said that, our deal sizes in the US have now, it's starting to see deal sizes in the five to $10 million range, right? Um, which we had not seen um, six to nine months back. And uh, that's really what's giving us confidence because that's very different from the type of deals that we've seen in the last two years. And uh, many of them are integrated deals. Uh, many of them are managed services deals. And many of them are combination deals across multiple technologies. So um, that's the range that I'm referring to, uh, you know, in the five to ten million dollar range. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. And best of luck for the future. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sahil from SS Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, well, one thing I wanted to understand: uh, the major focus of our strategy has been. Oracle Cloud and ERP. Uh, is there any focus or could there be any focus on, you know, diversifying the set of uh, cloud providers we work with? Because, for example, Azure, uh, AWS, Google Cloud are all hyperscalers, and being in those value chains might allow us to grab a larger share of customer volume. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, again, um, the Oracle business led by uh, Umang and team um, have done a fantastic job. Our uh, focus on that is, is really helping. Like I mentioned, you know, we're the only company listed on Oracle's website uh, where we're able to effectively compete. So that advantage and that differentiation we want to maintain. Having said that, uh, absolutely, you know, the uh, the three platforms that you mentioned, or the couple of platforms you mentioned, and then also a couple that I mentioned earlier. So part of our strategy is also to look at Microsoft, uh, not just Azure, definitely Azure and uh, related uh, hyperscalers, but also Microsoft as a whole, uh, where we are seeing some good traction in the Power Automate uh, around the business intelligence, around Azure DevOps. Uh, Salesforce is another platform that we're very bullish on. Um, the win that we had is giving us confidence that we can build pipeline in that space as well. Um, ServiceNow is another area that we started getting traction in particular geography, so we can at least we can take that uh, to the UK and Europe uh, and uh, US markets as well. And, uh, you know, AWS, uh, we've seen some really good traction in uh, in UK. Uh, so, so we've been very selective also in terms of which um, platforms and which uh, cloud um, uh, solutions to bet on. Uh, but Azure and uh, AWS are definitely part of the strategy. 
and uh, Salesforce, UiPath, and ServiceNow are definitely part of the strategy. Uh, we are not planning to build any capability in SAP. We are not planning to build any capability in any competing direct uh, to Oracle ERP providers. But these uh, platforms that I talked about are all complementary. And we are seeing that in the same accounts that we are already in. Um, and that's really what I was referring to in the capability build as well. We focused on these four or five platforms and you start seeing more deals in, in that space as well. That's great. Uh, if at all possible, I would suggest, uh, if possible, to please break down, you know, any kind of revenue, like how much of it comes at all from these other platforms, because it helps us understand sort of the diversification of the revenue stream. Uh, the second question I have for you is, uh, if you look at our uh, attrition rate at 28%, it's possibly one of the highest that we have seen among, you know, listed peers. And I'm just trying to understand, you know, when I compare to some of the peers, uh, this is fairly high. And like, is there any reason for that? Like, why are attrition and even like pre-COVID, it used to be fairly high at around 20% or so. Um, I don't correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, if you want to add, but I think uh, our attrition number is 7%, 7.1%. Um, and and uh, that's the same number or in that range is where we were in Q2. So, or uh, the comment that I had made earlier uh, in terms of quarter and quarter stabilization was related to the range of um, that percentage points. Uh, now, having said that, it is high, and uh, clearly there is uh, um, there is increased focus on that. We we do believe that in the last three four months, our um, HR and people uh, experience team have done a phenomenal job, and um, we are seeing uh, early signs of that stabilization, like I mentioned. Um, you know, it's not going to come down to pre-COVID levels or uh, levels from last two years. But, um, you know, we, we do believe that we'll get a lot more uh, aligned with industry standard uh, as it relates to attrition. Uh, at the same time, we focused and increased our uh, efforts on recruiting, uh, both in freshers and naturals. So that combination effect uh, is giving us that uh, confidence about uh, catering to the demand. Uh, that's in front of us. But but yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, there is uh, uh, a slightly higher percentage compared to the industry when it comes to our numbers, and we do plan to bring that back uh, in line. And then, uh, if you want to add a Yeah, and as, as uh, Viral mentioned, uh, we have seen quarter quarter attrition quite flat. Uh, there's an early sign of recovery at the, you know, scaling curve of the quarter. However, you know, when you're seeing the 12 months LTM, which we report, which includes, uh, you know, quarter of last year as well, but the attrition was not that high, was, was pretty low, the lower single digit, which, which is causing, you know, uh, quarter and quarter LTM numbers to look high. But as a confidence, which we are getting internally is with a lot of initiative, which has been taken up as a retention strategy, the whole HR and PXC team is working on that. Recruitment team is working into multiple direction, breaking up, hiring, offer to joining ratio to all other levers to ensure people join and not much of the decline is happening. So it's a multiple intervention which has been done at the company level and you feel more comfortable that, you know, attention is stabilizing and definitely we need, need to do a lot as a focus to ensure we keep reducing this attention percentage to drive the growth. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sudhari from Montreal Investment Partners. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, a couple of questions from my side. Uh, the client additions have been somewhat softer compared to a few quarters. So do you want to understand if that is a step change uh, in terms of the different strategy where you will be more focused in terms of the clients you pick upon? And second would be on the on-site offshore mix. So although the mix has remained pretty stable, the absolute growth on the on-site has been a bit more. Do you want to understand if that is something which is more sustainable and this is what will be going forward or is it on the back of a new project that you've taken on? Thanks. Sure. Arun, why don't you start with the second part uh, and then I'll cover the first on the client side. Sure. Uh, very quickly, in terms of onshore, offshore makes the kind of account you are seeing is quite, uh, you know, in the range from last uh, uh, couple of quarters. Uh, we believe that the issue is going to remain range bound. There could be 100, 200 bits improvement, which may happen as, as you grow more of the private sector business because uh, the public sector is primarily focused on the onshore headcount. 
uh, some of them yes have offshore opportunity as well but as we as we grow our our private sector a lot in terms of integrated solutioning and other strategy we are talking about the us we are talking about europe and other geography uh, we believe this ratio may improve but but not significantly we believe 100 to 200 this could be a good range uh, here i'll over to you for for the client addition part yeah i think uh, we answered that uh, earlier but but if you um, uh, can clarify the question once more because i i think uh, our client um, base is fairly high compared to most of our competitors and and we have um taking a focused strategy on on larger clients as well as higher quality revenue uh, within the existing clients so uh, to some extent it is by design and to some extent it is our uh, improved ability to engage with fortune 1000 and uh, fortune 500 customers i know we talk about fortune 1000 as a whole but um, interestingly we've had actually a couple of wins uh, in q3 which are with fortune 500 customers and these are actually very large global clients as well um, one of them in particular is in the consumer and CPG space, which is a, a, a very large client uh, and, and also has the ability um, for us to deliver multiple services and multiple service offerings uh, to them. So, so the nature of our discussions, uh, the size of our deals, the impact that we're able to make in our existing customers is starting to improve. Uh, this goes back to our account mining and client mining efforts, uh, which we've talked about in the past. Um, so we're not necessarily that focused on purely the number of clients that we're adding. While that is an important part of our strategy, but um, we would prefer to go much deeper in our existing client base, and uh, we're seeing the potential to do that uh, with our client base as well. Totally, that that addresses your question. Today, does this answer your question? Thank you. Since there's no response on the line, uh, we will move to the next participant that is on the line of Lisa from Equentis. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's relating to the order size. Uh, uh, actually, the industry is moving towards you know uh, smaller size deals because uh, the revenue generation is faster in that sense. So I wanted to ask about your strategy of moving to larger deals. And also I wanted to understand the range of deals that you are you know, targeting. What will be the range of the larger deals? Sure. So, uh, Lisa, it's a good point when it comes to the digital engineering uh, work that we do. Uh, a lot of uh, the customers are uh, looking at uh, smaller deals in terms of uh, not just the size, but the term of the contract as well. Uh, and uh, we continue to have that type of business when it comes to what we call as land and expand, which is, uh, you know, starting with a particular uh, point in, in place and then expanding to other areas. And in the particular specific deals might not be that large, but over a period of time, it does add up. Now, having said that, uh, the profile of the deals that we've had historically, uh, particularly in the Americas, have been much smaller. Like I mentioned, you know, two years back, uh, 500K was a large deal, right? Um, yeah. So now we are starting to see that $5 million, $10 million deal. So I'm talking about that range of deals, which may not be uh, large deals for some of our competitors, but I think uh, in our case, it's a significant, um, you know, higher uh, profile of deals. Uh, that, that we are seeing in, in the U.S. market. When it comes to U.K., um, what we call large deal is anything above a $25 million uh, deal. And uh, we see a lot of mid-sized deals in the 10 to 15, $20 million ranges in terms of uh, three-year deals. But uh, also our ability now to compete uh, in those 25, $30 million plus deals has significantly improved. And this is based on credibility and, and work we've delivered. I mean, keeping in mind that uh, our customer satisfaction index and credibility of our go lives, we've had about 60, 60 customer go lives and releases in Q3. Right? Some of them have been small, some of them have been large. But uh, the point is that uh, there has been no escalation, there has been uh, you know, no downtime, and that is giving us the ability to compete in some of these larger deals. So I would say you know, about 30 million, about 25 million would be a large deal in, in UK, uh, and about 5 million uh, would be a significant deal in, in the US market. So hopefully that uh, addresses your question. Yeah, that is helpful. And also uh, another question was about 
the are you uh, facing any challenges in the next quarter like do you see any challenges in us or uk with the orders closure Um, can, can you clarify that the challenges in terms of order closure? That- like uh, you'll had the seasonality issues in Q2 and uh, Q3, right? In Q2, I think it was yeah. related to COVID. In Q3, it was uh, because of the seasonality issues. There were deal slippages. But do you see that in Q4? Yeah, sure, sure. So Q3 was a Q3 was a good order booking quarter for us from a um, from a deal momentum perspective, even though. typically um, you know the last week 10 days in december is a little bit tricky uh, for the holidays but uh, you know our teams did a phenomenal job in in stepping up and and closing some large orders even in december um now having said that um um the the uh, larger deals that i was referring to typically do take slightly longer cycles and and you know some of them are more competitive um you know the large logistics company uh and tracking um, carrier deal that we won uh actually has uh, had competition uh which is significantly bigger than us not just the tier one indian it services companies but even large mncs that you probably recognize so we been able to beat some of the larger competition and in deals like that right it's going to take a longer process uh, it's a much more rigorous process so um that's the only thing i would add saying that you know some of these more strategic and and larger deals uh, are taking a little bit longer in terms of the competitive life cycle um but otherwise we don't see any uh, uh any in seasonality or any such thing in q4 uh, uh, or q1 going forward thank you before take the next question participants are requested to limit their question to one per participant thank you the next question is on the line of ashish das from sher khan by being taiba please go ahead thanks for the opportunity <clears throat> hope i am audible uh, my question is uh, on margin uh, arun you mentioned that uh, there could be some uh, downside in the margin why i am asking uh, see uh, this quarter there was no bullish so uh, in q2 it had uh, 200 days in fact still we are delivering a flat margin and i can see there are strong growth in uh, data and cloud businesses so uh, it's basically high margin businesses so uh, when you say downside not significant could you please uh, give the outlook uh, of margin what kind of downside you are expecting in a fy earlier you used to mention that high thing so is it that kind of margin you are expecting Yeah, Ashish. When I'm talking about downside, I'm I'm talking in the range of 1500 bips, uh, not more than that. And that to more more to led by you know, if you know some wages are going up, some you will be able to pass on to customers. Some still you have to bear. At the same time, you are working on operating levers. There could be certain timing gap in terms of improvement and the timing of the cost which is coming on. We believe uh, you know we are roughly in the range of 21% uh, margin profile. We are comfortable, you know. Anything, any, any reduction in the range of 50 to 100 bits maximum. Otherwise, we don't see uh, any more impact in, in at least in short term. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Now that's all. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Samir Pardikar from ICICI Direct. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so, what is a rough mix about? Uh, in UK market about uh, government and a private. Hello. Uh, Arun, we can get the question. I can get the question for you. Yeah. See, roughly. Yeah. So I again, uh, broadly it will be seventy, seventy, thirty percent kind of a ratio. Well, we don't don't share exact percentage, Sami, but uh, broadly seventy, thirty kind of a ratio. Seventy percent of the public yeah. sector and thirty percent of the private sector. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I think last quarter you talked about uh, around 25 to 30 deals in the pipeline. Uh, so how much uh, deals are already closed, and how much deals that we are basically uh, looking going forward? Any update on the the deal deals over there, uh, which you mentioned the last quarter? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think uh, some of that you're some of you're seeing that reflect in the. Um, Uh, in the Q3 results as well, with the order book uh, backlog as well as the uh, uh, the increased activity in terms of deal closures, um, we um, continue to build on that pipeline. So obviously, since we spoke last and and uh, since the last quarter, 
a call, we've added more deals in the pipeline as well. Uh, many of them have closed, um, and and uh, many of them are uh, slated to close in this current quarter. So um, that pipeline is obviously a, a continuous process. Uh, you can expect uh, a few more uh, significant deals in this current quarter as well. And uh, that is again across uh, UK as well as Americas uh, in, in the ranges that I was referring to earlier. So. Okay, and, and regarding this Middle East, uh, our uh, strategy about only few clients and more uh, quality kind of a revenue. So what is our thought process behind this? Uh, uh, is it a geopolitical uh, risk is there or, or what is basically stopping us to go for a larger number of deals over there? No, so so um, maybe maybe I can clarify that a little bit. So we are actually seeing um, increased deal activity even in the Middle East. Uh, the point uh, that I was trying to emphasize on is that uh, the nature of the new clients that we're able to engage are now slightly larger clients where we believe that there's a much more longer and uh, downstream view of the mining that we can do with those clients, right? Second is in our existing clients, you know, about 50% of our existing clients, uh, we feel are great candidates for cross-sell and uh, co-sell in terms of integrated value propositions. In fact, uh, uh, we moved a senior person uh, from, uh, uh, from India to Middle East uh, who's going to be focused this purely on this activity on, on cross sell and digital services in the Middle East. So um, the, the, the broader strategy there is that because we're seeing, you know, increased engagement with larger clients, as well as our ability to mine better in certain segment of clients, um, it doesn't make sense to go after every single deal. Um, so we have a focus strategy on certain verticals and uh, growing certain accounts where we now have delivery managers and account managers clusters of them for specific accounts that we feel can become much larger. So over a period of time, that will do two things. The number of clients, purely in terms of quantity of number of clients will reduce. The quality of the revenue and the margins will improve. And the account size uh, in terms of uh, the revenue coming from uh, an individual account on an average will increase as well. So we believe that's a better profile uh, when it comes to the Middle East business, which um, you know positions us competitively, and and uh, we we have a fairly good market share out there. So we have some good credibility and case studies um, to increase our wallet share with uh, some of our existing customers as well. So that's really the the, the overall strategy. Thank you. The next question is from the line of. Mohammed Patel from Care Portfolio Managers. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. My first question is in the presentation slide in the 14, so you have mentioned revenue by contract type. So the fixed price proportion has increased from 45 in Q2 to 49% in Q3. Is this the reason for the impact of top line in Q3? Go ahead. Can, can, you, can you speak quickly again? Uh, I mean, are you talking about fixed price engagement from 45 to 49? Fixed price proportion revenue has increased from 45% in Q2 to 49% in Q3. Yeah. So I just wanted to understand if this is the reason for the slow growth in Q2. No, I will. I will not. Uh, basically, that's that's not the uh, uh, may not be the right prediction of this factor because uh, we 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 have a both kind of engagement with our customers uh, where we go and talk about the outcome. Even a lot of TNM contractors are also based on the outcome, while fixed rates are definitely outcome oriented and the margin profiles are quite quite similar as well uh, the growth profile which we are getting both in terms of fixed bid and tnm in terms of content engagements also moving in the same direction so i will uh, you know maybe that that uh, reflection may not be right to to count okay so, so uh, arun, uh, arun if i can just clarify and add that i think it's a good point uh, when it comes to tying back to our strategy though uh, we do have um, um, an intent to do more fixed price projects and uh, also uh, more projects based on business outcomes. Uh, we believe that uh, differentiated us in, in terms of winning deals. Uh, we have the value-based delivery model that we had from uh, our cloud, Oracle Cloud business, which we are now adopting across Mastic. And uh, that ability will give us more predictability of revenue and uh, uh, 
you know, the, the ability to deliver on those fixed price projects I talked about some of the go lives and releases that we've had uh, is, is getting much stronger. So uh, to some extent, um, in terms of immediate near-term conversion, it, it might have had a, a slight impact because the time and materials business uh, has reduced a little bit. But uh, it is part of our strategy to do more uh, fixed price projects and more uh, business outcome-based uh, delivery. And, uh, you know, that potentially might be even higher in, in the coming quarters, uh, but that's part of our design uh, of longer-term engagements as well. Okay, so that is helpful. My second question is that uh, this performance claim incentive to use this management, so how much transfer is left? Uh, you're talking about the CCPS buyout? Yes. Uh, so at the moment, we have bought 10%, uh, which is going through all the approvals in place, and uh, the whole transfer of the cash and the issuance of equity will complete in the month of January. Uh, balance 20% will be buying out uh, in equal tranches uh, in uh, quarter three of uh, next year, or you can say calendar year uh, 2022, but quarter three, and uh, and similar time in the next year as well. Okay, okay. That's helpful. That's information. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vaibhav Banjatia from HNI Investment. Yeah, hi, sir. Thanks for providing the opportunity. I just have one question. Uh, so, how much? Uh, uh, I just wanted to understand what kind of impact the uh, uh, you know pound fluctuation can have on our bottom line. Uh, I understand that most of the public sector revenue, the costs are also uh, pound denominated. Uh, but uh, what's uh, in terms of, uh, on the revenue side uh, under the government contracts? Uh, uh, is there any clause where uh, we need to pass on some of the fluctuation, or it is just fully upon us? Uh, Weber, uh, all, all the currency is belong to the company. Uh, the contractings are more in terms of services we deliver. The pricing is done keeping certain currency, you know, fluctuation in the mind. So that if the mm -hmm. situation comes, uh, we, we can take care of it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, what we do, we have a hedging strategy as well. Uh, one, there's a natural hedging. Wherever you're serving onshore, there's an onshore cost as well. So you get the natural hedging uh, from that perspective. And whatever you are bringing back to India because of the offshore delivery, there's a hedging which is available. And, and we as a company uh, keep uh, very active uh, to ensure uh, the pricing which we have factored into the deals uh, with a certain weight in place. We try to cover at least, you know, uh, by keeping that weight in the mind when in the forward market. Right. And that, that natural hedge would be in the range of 60-70% of the revenue or it would be uh, lower? It, it, it's a similar thing, like you know, if you're seeing the headcon split, uh, headcon split, split gives you the kind of range between onshore and offshore. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Predic Sarkar from Unify Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks again. Uh, I understand the ramp downs in, uh, in the UK, uh, you know, might have been there in the previous quarter and given the impact of the third wave as well. Uh, given the NHS win today and the ramp of negatives that will come from the closure of other smaller projects, do you reckon we will get back into sequential growth territory starting three four itself? Yes, uh, well, the answer is yes. So, sure. And uh, you know, congrats on uh, crossing the hundred million dollar annualized threshold in Avisys. What is the annuity versus project split here? And importantly, uh, Larry's been talking about a twenty billion run rate of Biofa twenty six for uh, the cloud and the RP projects of Oracle. How does that shape your imagination of how your practice plan will play out by then? Yeah, so you know, I think uh, uh, our uh, strategic uh, nature of uh, partnership and and uh, the differentiation that we provide in Oracle cloud space has um, even gotten better. Uh, as you know, we announced, uh, in addition to, of course, uh, the overall cloud uptake in revenue, they announced a fairly big acquisition in Cerna. And uh, interestingly, um, um, you know, with some of the history in healthcare had done some work and has been doing some work in integrating Cerna with Oracle. So this puts us in a very unique position uh, because uh, our focus on healthcare and life sciences and our ability now to look at Oracle uh, uh, Cloud in a much bigger way, which includes Cerna, um, is, is also um, becoming interesting. Um, the deal 
some of the deals that I was talking about earlier, which is the front office to back office, uh, now can even be amplified as we start looking at um, uh, even uh, platforms like Serna, which become part of the core engine that drives uh, payers and providers. So, um, you know, all in all, Oracle uh, is bringing us to lot more larger deals and larger clients. Um, you know, the, the overall uptick in cloud revenue of Oracle, we don't see any stopping, uh, at least in the foreseeable two to three years. Uh, the market is still pretty... Uh, um, you know, high on 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 that growth because some customers are still starting that journey. Um, so so um, yeah, we are actually kind of um, continue to feel bullish about that space. Um, and and the Cerner acquisition recently has given us even more confidence to differentiate in the healthcare space. So that that's helpful. Would you have the annuity versus projects put handy? With any versus? Very quickly, very quickly tried it out. Uh, in, in the uh, Oracle in, uh, part of business, our, our managed services would be uh, closer to 30% and uh, closer to 70% would be kind of implementation business. So, and, and how much of your uh, $170 million order book today uh, is the UK private sector? Uh, Bedic, again, we don't provide the breakup, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, our UK business would be 70 30 split uh, in terms of public and private. That, that's helpful. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of a mother as an additional investor. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is related to uh, uh, the cloud solution that you mentioned that you are looking for uh, supplementary cloud solutions as well. So uh, are you looking for uh, developing these capabilities through uh, MNAs or organically? The second one is, uh, are we doing any work in terms of uh, cloud security solutions as uh, from other peers that we understand is that there is a high demand of uh, cloud security solutions as of now. So if you could explain that as well. Sure. So the, let me answer the second question first and then I'll come back to the first. So um, cloud security in many cases is starting to get embedded uh, as part of our discussions and engagements. In fact, one of the deals uh, that we won and a couple that we are delivering uh, are in areas what we call as DevSecOps. And what this really means is security is embedded in part of the application lifecycle and, and uh, you know, delivery that we're doing in terms of modernizing, in terms of operating and, and uh, moving them to the cloud. So that work we are, we are already doing. We have the capabilities uh, and, and the experience to do that. Now, having said that, we, we don't uh, necessarily focus on the security areas, um, you know, very exclusively. And there we're taking a partner-based approach. Uh, we have uh, ongoing discussions with two or three different cybersecurity companies. Uh, and uh, we believe that this is a good area for us to partner uh, when it comes to deeper cloud security capabilities that can uh, add on to, uh, you know, our digital engineering and cloud transformation uh, practices. Um, the first question, um, you know, I think I partly answered, but uh, just to kind of quickly address it, the uh, areas around Azure and AWS, uh, we have in-house and organic build activities ongoing. So we're keeping an eye out for uh, uh, inorganic and M&A as well in those areas. And the same holds good for the data automation space and the CX areas. Mm, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Parag Dharande as an individual investor. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Please? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more on your capital allocation? So, for example, how much you would like to give as a dividend and how much you want to retain? And the second thing is, you know, uh, the float in the market is very less. So, you know, any, uh, if there are buyers, the share goes high, if the sellers share go down, and this has been a historic uh, thing with Mustang. So, have you thought about uh, bringing in more stability or price in terms of by some increasing number of share by giving bonus or increasing split? Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank
thanks for for the question uh, in terms of capital allocation uh, we we have been giving dividend uh, in form of interim and the final dividend we believe uh, uh, that process will continue uh, and and as a part of capital allocation as we mentioned about the amini activity we believe there's a very good potential for us to keep growing and as a combination of of the strategy uh, some of portion of the growth should come through the organic investment some will come through partner modern some through amini so it's, it's basically the allocation which is required to meet the present 2025 and accordingly we will be you know allocating the capital but uh, our intention is to maintain the dividend on it uh, which we are running uh, currently uh, in terms of float uh, yeah very very valid point for us yes we we do see uh, the similar uh, you know pattern uh, since the float is low uh, as soon as significant buy comes in the prices start fluctuating significantly However, there is no current plan as such for the bonus issue because that depends a lot with the, you know, uh, other strategies including what you have in the reserves, how you can you can allocate and so on and so forth, including a lot of board level discussion. But definitely, we are keeping this on our mind. And as we move on uh, and as we finalize the strategy to to take further action on it, we'll we'll intimate all of you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Utkarsh Prasamaya as an individual investor. Please go ahead. Thank you. My questions have been answered. Thank you. We have a follow-up question from the line of Manoj Bhaiyadi from Carnelian Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, hi. Thanks for taking my question again. You know, uh, just a long-term strategic question to you. You mentioned uh, that uh, there is a transition which is happening from one-time implementation to managed services, and you are also aggressively working on that. so on this uh, two things if you can give some color that how you are building the capability talent what are the things you are doing for this kind of transition and if you can give some broader picture that in next three years say by 2025 what is your vision uh, if i see a revenue pie of your company between like one time implementation and managed services that will be really helpful Okay, so uh, Manoj, I think uh, this is a good. Uh, I believe this is the last question, but so this is a good way to uh, uh, end with the three-year strategy and and some of the strategic bets and priorities that we put together. Uh, so when we look at uh, that example that I gave, which was actually a healthcare provider, uh, in the past, when it comes to the cloud implementation business, what we had was uh, we used to do the implementation. and uh, typically in in most cases uh, our project ended and our engagement with the customer ended right mm-hmm. um clearly that was uh, uh, that was working to some extent because you know we went on to the next implementation and then we went on to the third implementation right so mm-hmm. uh, in in different customers and that's why you see a larger number of clients as well um uh, what we've now been able to do is put a bit of a more account focused strategy and uh, this does not just apply to managed services but it's basically looking at customers for life and looking at uh, account mining and, and the typical client partner strategy used to uh, grow these accounts so the example that i gave you was a classic one and we have few more like those uh, globally where uh, the implementation was very successful actually it was a very aggressive 6 uh, to 7 month implementation uh, which um, uh, you know the, the customers themselves were not very sure if we would be able to deliver but we actually delivered on it and we went live a couple of weeks back um, but uh, on top of that um, we started to frame up how we would transform their it landscape how we would look at not just supporting their applications in the cloud and the digital landscape but how we would provide certain additional innovation on top of that because moving to the cloud is just one part of the journey right the real value and that's the reason why we feel we're in a unique position is because you know almost 50% of our customers have moved to the cloud in some fashion and now they're starting to look at the cloud economics and look at how how will they innovate and how will they create differentiation for their customers meaning our customers customers so that's where we are playing in and managed services is just one step towards that uh, clearly uh, requires a different type of skills and and uh, talent building which we have done uh, over the last few months so this is not a new uh, initiative as such but we have strengthened our ability to do that uh, driving is definitely a key part of our overall three year strategy as well 
where uh, we look at larger uh, accounts uh, in terms of the lifetime value that we get from the customer and the value we are delivering to the customer as well, right? Uh, not stopping at a particular project. It could be a cloud implementation or a digital engineering project or an e-commerce project, but looking at it in multiple uh, surround areas uh, and, and building our... Uh, uh, presence and wallet shares uh, around uh, surround areas within that customer as well. So that that is one. Second is uh, you know our overall managed services business is probably going to go uh, higher in the next uh, few quarters, and you'll see that reflected. Uh, you know there is no specific target that we have, but we believe we can take it to 40 to 45 percent of our overall business, which gives us a lot more predictability and uh, annuity revenue. And that would be a good place to be in, uh, in addition to what we do from a digital engineering and a cloud transformation perspective. Because we do see that there is going to be a lot, uh, lot more uh, investments in data, in automation, in uh, specific areas around uh, uh, industry clouds. So some of that will still be project-based. And uh, you know we have a fairly solid project-based DNA in our ability to close uh, and engage, uh, whether it's cloud projects or digital projects. Um, you know, when, when we look at uh, two or three other levers um, and take a three-year view, uh, there is, um, you know, the industry vertical focus that we talked about, and I know we've talked a lot about healthcare and life sciences, but we're seeing some really good traction in manufacturing-centric clients as well. Uh, this is where the industrial manufacturing, even the engineering and construction uh, kind of company is coming to play. Uh, we've also seen some initial signs of uh, specific financial services uh, customers where we've been able to differentiate. So, um, you know, our, our ability to be very industry specific in our differentiation and engagement is an important part of our strategy as well. Uh, a lot of these platform companies, you know, whether it's Microsoft or Salesforce or ServiceNow or Snowflake or even Oracle uh, and others have started to invest in industry clouds. And uh, to us, that's a very positive sign because uh, it, it um, really uh, aligns well with the strategy that we've been using uh, to go deep into the industry. So, you know, those are some of the elements that we have as part of our uh, 2025 vision. And uh, some of that is in, in motion right now. And of, of course, we're going to amplify many of them in the coming quarters. So hopefully that uh, this is your question as well, Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that would be our last question for today. I now hand the conference over to the management for the closing comments. Thank you, and over to you. All right, so um, I, I think um, uh, this was a, a longer session than expected, but just a, a fantastic set of questions. Um, I think, you know, I, on behalf of Arun and Mashank as well, I'm sure uh, we've really enjoyed the uh, interaction. Um, I do want to uh, reiterate um, that um, our people, uh, are our most important asset, and uh, our customers uh, have always been the focus for us. So we will not uh, deviate from those two principles uh, because um, you know doing the right thing for the customer and delivering well on time, which is what we've done, um, and uh, taking care of our people uh, is, is really what's going to uh, position us better in the future. Uh, we want to really thank our investors and uh, all the analysts in the call as well um, for your support and trust. Um, as you would have seen, um, Mastec uh, logo has been updated um, with uh, three uh, words which go hand in hand with what we've done and what we do, uh, trust, value, and velocity. And uh, we will be living each of those in every single stakeholder. So uh, whether it's customers, whether it's our society, our employees, our investors, uh, our uh, heritage is based on trust. Uh, our focus is uh, going to continue to base, be based on delivering value, whether it's business value, whether it's career value for employees, whether it's um, social value in our society. And um, we're very confident that our entire leadership team and the entire master care force uh, of 4,800 people uh, have come together really well in these challenging times. And uh, we're looking forward to more uh, exciting um, times ahead. Uh, I know there's still a lot of um, you know, variant and, and pandemic uh, around us, and, and I really, uh, uh, um, you know, wish everyone all the best and, and stay safe. Uh, we will continue to be transparent and share more details as we make progress. And uh, again, thank you for all the questions. Thank you very much. 
ladies and gentlemen on behalf of mastex limited that concludes this conference thank you all for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines